And it became quite clear to me, it became quite clear to me that um, very often teachers had doubts and questions about the viability of doing task-based language teaching. And so I decided to prepare this PowerPoint to look at some of the problems, the questions that teachers raise with me and see if I can suggest answers. Right, I'm trying to move my slides, but they won't move. Now, okay. why is that? So it is not moving? No, it's not moving. Hmm. Can you escape it and see? Yeah, maybe I need to do that. So um, I've got to what? Yeah, how do I get out of it? That's a question. Um, just, uh, just click escape. If you click on it first and click escape. It doesn't even want to move with that. Oh, maybe you're looking at your, uh, um, yeah, at our shared I'm screen. going to uh, stop sharing screen, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And then I'm going to try and share screen again. And here we go. But it is still not moving. Okay. Maybe you can, it's not full screen. Yeah, but it, it still won't move even with full screen, but I can try. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, it's amazing how one always has these technical problems <laughs> when you do Zooms, right? Yeah. Um, and you want, want, it becomes impossible to anticipate them. I try to, um, but I don't seem to succeed. Anyhow, onwards. Well, first of all, I've got to actually ask the question, what is task-based language teaching? I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but I thought that I would very quickly uh, uh, give a quick little definition. Uh, and here it is, task-based teaching views learning as taking place holistically and incidentally as learners perform tasks that involve listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So the two, the two key words are holistically and incidentally. So holistically means that there is no attempt to teach specific items of language. You're asking learners to engage with the language that you're teaching holistically without trying to um, uh, teach specific linguistic features. And incidentally means that as learners perform tasks, they will pick up language without consciously aiming to do so, uh, without any intention to learn. That when people do task-based language teaching, their intention is not to learn, their intention is to perform the tasks. And the learning that takes place will be incidental. Um, in effect, what this is doing is attempting to replicate the most successful example of language acquisition that we have, which is when you learn your mother tongue. When you're a child and you learn your mother tongue, then learning takes place holistically and incidentally. Teachers do not teach language, so the aim of the teacher is not to teach, but to facilitate its development. So that's what task-based language teaching is about. How does task-based teaching differ from traditional language teaching? It differs in two key ways. There's no attempt to teach specific bits and pieces of language. And secondly, uh, this really follows on from the first difference. Uh, first difference, a task-based syllabus simply consists of a list of tasks. There's no list of grammatical structures, no list of vocabulary, vocabulary to be taught, no list of language functions, no list of, of, of notions, just a list of tasks. Uh, I thought I would very quickly give a, uh, a comparison between a traditional lesson and a task-based lesson. So in the traditional lesson, what you do is typically have an, ob an, uh, uh, an objective which states that what language you want to teach. 
and I gave an example, students will be able to use the prepositions in, at, on correctly in different time expressions. So that's what you have as an aim. And if we now move to task-based language teaching, a typical objective just states the outcome of the task that is to be achieved. For example, in a spot the difference task, a spot the difference task is when you put students into pairs and one student has one picture, another has another picture. They're very similar, these pictures, but there are some differences in them. And the task is to find the differences without looking at each other's pictures. So students have to talk together to find, in this case, five differences. It's always a good idea to specify the number of differences that they have to have. So the outcome is simply whether they have been able to identify the differences, okay? So I, I try to make clear what task-based language teaching is about and what traditional language teaching is about. Um, I also do want to deal very quickly with the question of what is a task, uh, because there is misunderstanding about what a task is. I've given one example, a spot the difference task, and um, I try to give a very clear definition of what a task is in terms of these five, criteria, four criteria. There must be a primary focus on meaning. So students must be trying to use language rather than to learn it. Point I've already made, there's no intention to learn. There's just an intention to do the task. There must be some kind of gap and it's this that motivates the exchange of information or opinions. So in the, um, uh, in, in the spot the difference task, because they can't see each other's picture, there's a gap. And it's that that motivates them to try to describe their picture, ask questions about the picture to find the differences. The students must rely mainly on their own linguistic and non-linguistic resources. So non-linguistic resources are things like guessing what something means by relating what you hear to what you can see or something that's happening, gesture, facial expressions, etc. So they, can, they have to rely on their own linguistic resources because they are not being directly taught what linguistic resources to use. And finally, there's got to be a communicative outcome the task is completed when the outcome is achieved and successful completion does not depend on using the language correctly, okay? And here is a, an example of a task that I often give. This is called uh, going shopping. Uh, actually, this is not a task as presented on this screen. It's actually an exercise rather than a task because there is no gap. And the reason why there's no gap is because the students doing this exercise can see Mary's shopping list and can see Abdullah's store. And also at the bottom, they're given the language that they, that they uh, should use. So you can see here that um, uh, basically they're not really using their own linguistic resources. It's a kind of clever blank filling activity really. But we can reorganize this information to make it a task. And so this makes one very important point, and that is that sometimes you can change an exercise into a task simply by creating the gap and by specifying what it is that each student has to do. So here you can see that student A can see Mary's shopping list and student B can see Abdullah's store. This task tells student A what they have to do, student B what they have to do. You don't provide them with any language that they have to do, and they have to set about doing the task. There's a clear outcome. So for student A, it's the items that they want to buy. For students B, it's the items that A asked for that are not stocked in the store. So it clearly matches the four criteria of my definition. One of the important points is that you can have the same task, but different learning results. 
uh, because there's no attempt to specify what language learners will learn. So obviously different students can end up learning different language as a result of performing the same task. You're not specifying what learners will learn. They are learning incidentally, and clearly there will be individual differences. Uh, Task-based language teaching also requires focus on form. Learners have to pay attention to form as they are performing a task. And teacher has an important role here if it's the teacher doing the task with the learners, because the teacher can draw learners' attention to specific linguistic forms. This is not the same as teaching the linguistic forms because it's taking place while they're students doing the task. And there are other ways also of getting learners to focus on form, such as letting them plan before they perform the task, uh, if it's an input-based task, a listening task, a reading task, we might highlight features in the input to draw their attention to them. The idea of focus on form is to facilitate incidental learning, not to directly teach specific forms. Okay, so I, I wanted to start with that very quick introduction as to what task-based language teaching is. So now we come to the word resistance, because I know that sometimes teachers and students find task-based language teaching threatening because it's so different from the kind of teaching they are used to. Teachers often feel more secure if they have a very clear objective for a lesson, a very clear linguistic objective for a lesson. They often find, feel more secure if they can go into the lesson saying, I'm going to teach prepositions of time today. Uh, and as a result of this, because of their uncertainty, insecurity, when they are suddenly asked to teach without specifying what it is that learners are, are going to learn, uh, it can actually lead them to resist adopting task-based language teaching. So we, we now come to what is the, the, the focus of this talk, uh, which is problems and solutions that I have found teachers face, uh, their problems, my solutions. Um, the first thing I often hear is that task-based teaching seems to be all about speaking but what about reading and writing? And I, I think that this particular belief amongst teachers has come about because some explanations of task-based language teaching, including the one that I've just given you, tends to illustrate task-based language teaching only using speaking tasks and doesn't illustrate it using reading and writing tasks. But in fact, we can devise tasks that involve any one of the language skills. We can develop listening tasks or reading tasks or writing tasks, etc. As long as the task satisfies my four criteria, then uh, it doesn't matter what the skill is. So task-based language teaching is not just about speaking. It's about all the language skills. And indeed, many tasks are what you might call integrated skills task, because they can involve all of the uh, language skills. And the example that I often give is the heart transplant task. The heart transplant task um, puts students into a group of four, and each student is given information, written information, uh, about uh, a very sick person who needs a heart transplant. And the task that they are given is to read the information, make sure that they understand it, and then talk together un until they can decide who they think is the the most worthy person 
to get the heart transplant because there's only one heart available, okay? So there's reading, uh, there's speaking and listening because they're talking to each other. And it's very easy to bring in uh, a writing task at the end by asking them to write a report about the recommendation that they have made. Why do they think this person uh, is the best person to get the heart transplant? Why do they think the other three are not such ideal people to get the heart transplant? Writing a report. So you can see that in a complex task, like the heart transplant task, it's possible to include all four language skills. So that's one thing that I tell teachers. No, if you think it's all about speaking, that's wrong. You can devise tasks relating to any of the language skills. You can devise integrated tasks. And now, believe it or not, I've frozen again. Ah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. It seems I have to be patient. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not a long way from wherever Zoom is. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the second question that I'm often asked, this is a really common one. How can I do task-based teaching with beginner level learners? Now, you, you will remember that one of my criteria for a task is that the students have to use their own linguistic resources and non-linguistic resources. So that does raise a question, doesn't it? That if you have beginner level learners, you know, they don't have any linguistic resources in the second language, English, if that is the second language, right? So how can they do tasks? And indeed, not only uh, some teachers that I've talked to, but also some quite leading figures in the field of uh, language teaching have also suggested that task-based language teaching is not suitable for beginners, et cetera. And I think that this particular question arises again, because they tend to think that tasks have to involve speaking, but they don't. Some tasks can involve listening or some tasks can involve just uh, reading. They can be what I call input-based tasks rather than output-based tasks. And I think it is possible to devise very simple input-based tasks that even complete beginners can do. They are going to need some help from the teacher, but I have one of my PhD students, um, her name is Natsuko Shintani, and she taught a group of six-year-old Japanese children English using tasks, and these children were complete beginners. I mean complete, they didn't know any English. And she devised tasks that involved them um, taking animals, to uh, taking animals to a zoo. They were given little pictures of animals. There was a sort of picture of the zoo on the wall and little pockets. And, they, and she would say things like, okay, find the hippopotamus and take it to the zoo. And of course they wouldn't really know what she said. And she would repeat it, and then one of them would guess. They would hold up a card, and she would say, no, no, no. And then they would try another one, and then eventually they got it right. And then they took the card, and they put it in the little slot on the picture of the zoo, etc. So she repeated these tasks nine times. And what she was able to show was that gradually over, this was in a five week period, these complete beginners were able to understand what she was saying, were able to choose the correct picture, et cetera. And she was also able to show that whereas initially all they did is listen to her and maybe sometimes speak in Japanese, but by the end of the five weeks, they were beginning to actually use words and speak in English a little. 
So not only was their listening comprehension improving, but also they were developing the confidence to try and say something in English themselves. So what am I saying? The answer to this question is that if you're teaching beginner level learners, don't use output based tasks, don't use speaking tasks, don't use writing tasks, use input based tasks, probably listening. But if the students are able to uh, read um, the alphabetical uh, writing, then they could also perhaps uh, uh, be given simple reading tasks as well. And this is how learn, this is how you start learning your mother tongue. You know, your mother speaks to you, you don't, or your father, you don't understand what they say. It's repeated. Help is given to show you what your mother is talking about. And gradually you learn the language. There's no direct teaching of the language. Gradually you learn. I think this is a very good question. How do I know what language learners have learned in task-based language teaching? Uh, remember that task-based language teaching involves incidental language learning. And remember also, I've told you that what individual learners learn from doing a task um, is not necessarily going to be the same. So, you know, you teach a lesson built around a task. How do you know learners have actually learned some language? Well, Natsuko Shintani was able to see that they were learning language because she could see that initially they had to really struggle to understand what she was saying. But over time, she could see that they could understand, she, they could understand what she was saying. So she could see that learning was taking place. And she also saw that they started to actually use some English words themselves, et cetera. So um, over time, you can see that they are learning. I think the problem comes within a single lesson because in a single lesson, it is sort of quite difficult to know whether learners have learned anything. And um, I, I, I offer two suggestions here, that where vocabulary is involved, you can write up the key words needed to perform the task on the whiteboard before students do the task and ask them if they know them. And then you can remove the words. And then after performing the task, you can show them the words again and check if they now know them. And I think what you will find is that they, they will all agree that there were some words that they didn't really know and at the end of it, there were words that they knew, et cetera. So you can tell that some learning is taking place. And I think that's very useful for teachers to do. Grammatical structures is a different issue and more difficult to deal with because they are acquired very slowly and gradually. You don't acquire a grammatical structure uh, in terms of your ability to use that grammatical structure instantly or even in one lesson. It's a very slow and gradual process. Um, and so it's quite difficult to show that they've acquired a grammatical structure simply by performing one task in one lesson. And this is where you do need to observe how students do tasks over a period of time to see if there's any progress in their communicative ability to use particular grammatical structures. So where vocabulary is concerned, you, you can actually do something that tells you whether they've learned something in a single lesson based on a single task. But with grammatical structures, you need to take a more longitudinal uh, perspective. This is a question that, again, some critics of task-based language teaching have advanced, which is where is the grammar in task-based teaching? And, you know, this is a question that certainly my teachers in China um, very frequently asked me because um, they felt that they needed to be able to teach grammar. And so they felt that task-based language teaching doesn't involve the teaching of grammar. Well, in a way, they are right. It doesn't involve 
the teaching of grammar explicitly, directly, but this doesn't mean that there is no grammar in task based language teaching, right? In fact, grammar comes into task based language teaching in a number of ways. First of all, you can ask learners to plan what I've called strategic planning or pre task planning. Um, and you might want very briefly to give them an indication of some specific structures that would be useful when performing the task. Although that's always dangerous because now you're feeding students the structures and they might therefore feel that they deliberately have to use them. So that's not my preferred way. Uh, in guided strategic planning though, I think it's quite legitimate to um, let learners um, use their mobile phones in order to try to look up words and phrases that they think might help them perform the task. Here the teacher is not giving them the language, they are finding the language themselves that they think might help them to do the task. Um, another way is by performing focus tasks. And I, I so far haven't talked about different types of tasks, and that would be another lecture, but a focus task is a task that is being designed to teach a particular grammatical structure. So let's say that the grammatical structure was prepositions of time. Now we might design a spot the difference task where all the differences in the pictures, sorry, not, uh, not time, place, prepositions of place. And we might design a spot the difference task where the differences all relate to where different objects in the picture are in different positions, on, in, under, next to, over the top of, et cetera. And that provides an opportunity for students to use those prepositions of place. And we call that a focus task because the task has been specially designed to try to provide an opportunity for them to use the particular structure that you want to draw their attention to, et cetera. This is not the same as teaching them the grammatical structure because you don't tell them that the task involves using prepositions of location, prepositions of place. You design the task so it sets up opportunities for them to do it. And I think focus tasks do have a place in language teaching. The danger is that the teaching could be turned into a more traditional type uh, grammar lesson, present, practice, produce. There are two other ways in which grammar comes in. One is through focus on form techniques. Uh, and I've already mentioned how important focus on form is for language teaching. Uh, one of these techniques involves corrective feedback. So if the students are doing a task with the teacher, the, the student has an opportunity to uh, correct the students. Uh, and the idea is that this is done in a way that doesn't intrude from the primary focus on communication. Um, if we go back to uh, how your mother helped you learn your mother tongue, we know that mothers often do do some kinds of correction of their students' errors, often by repeating what their students said, uh, what their child said, uh, correcting an error that they made. And that's the, the idea that underlies uh, focus on form. And the final way in which we can introduce some explicit grammar teaching is in the post-task stage of a lesson. Uh, because a task-based lesson typically involves some kind of pre-task activity. The main task, when they're doing the task, that's when you get the focus on form, and then a post-task activity. If you see learners making particular errors, grammatical errors, while they're doing the main task, in the post-task, there can be an opportunity for now directly teaching those particular grammatical structures. 
The idea here is that we only do direct teaching when we have seen that students have a problem with a grammatical structure. We don't preempt the problem, we react to problems that we see that they have. And once again, I seem to momentarily have frozen. My screen has frozen. Come on, Zoom, wake up. <laughs> and it won't. Hmm. I wonder if I, no, it won't. This is so annoying, isn't it, hey? Yeah, technology can be annoying. Yeah, there we go. Maybe I found another way of doing it. Okay, the next question. What do I do if students use their mother tongue? Okay, well, the first thing is that if they are beginner language learners and you're doing a task with them and you as the teacher are primarily using uh, English, the L2, uh, to do the task, I wouldn't worry too much if they are using their L1. It's entirely natural for them to use their L1, right? Uh, what is important is that the teacher continues to provide input in English, et cetera. Uh, but we do know from research that uh, there is a danger that students will overuse their L1, okay? Um, so what do we do about this? First of all, not worry too much because it is useful for students to work out how to do a task before they get started on a task and using the L1 to make sure that they understand what they have to do makes good sense. And I've already said that teachers can make strategic use of their mother tongue to help students understand. Strategic use, not full sentences, but individual words to maybe help them understand. So it's not using the mother tongue that is a problem, it's overusing it, okay? And these are my suggestions. Make sure the task is at the right level. Uh, if you have a task that involves uh, a lot of speaking and you have students who lack speaking ability, that is probably not the right task. And you're gonna end up uh, with them using a lot of L1. This is what happened in a study uh, in Hong Kong. Hong Kong introduced task-based language teaching in the primary school. And one researcher went out to have a look to see what was happening. And this, uh, this researcher, uh, his name was Carles. Um, he found that uh, the, the primary school students were doing the tasks, but primarily in the L1. But the problem here was that the tasks were too difficult for their ability in English. Uh, the tasks were not at the right level. If you have learners who have very, very limited communicative ability, then you need to make plentiful use of input-based tasks, uh, speaking ta uh, not speaking tasks, listening tasks. Uh, another thing is to give the students opportunity to plan before they do the task. And another thing is to repeat the task, or maybe to do a similar task with the students first, the teacher doing the task with all the students, and then put the students into pairs or small group work to do a very, very similar task, so that they've had a kind of model about what they have to do. So in other words, this overuse of the L1 is, if you like, more to do with ineffective teaching. The teacher is not thinking through um, what kinds of tasks and how the tasks are used with the students in order to minimize their use of the L1, to help them minimize it. Okay, I found out how to move, to move it. How can I use tasks in a mixed ability class? I think most teachers face the fact that their class is likely to include students of a range of abilities. And this does raise a question as to how you can do tasks. Um, 
I, I, I do want to make, I'm, I'm going to go through these points here, or you can read these points for yourself that you can see here. But I want to tell you about a, a very interesting talk that I heard recently. I went to um, a conference on task-based language teaching in Austria, and uh, I attended one of the talks where um, the person giving the talk was describing how the same task was done by students of very different levels of ability. So sometimes I think it is possible to devise tasks that actually can be done in very, very simple ways, but can also be done in more advanced ways. The task that she gave her students to do was called the Martian task. And basically it asked students to work in pairs and one person had to pretend they came from Mars and the other had to pretend they were an earthling. And then they had to talk to each other uh, and ask questions of each other uh, to find out what life was like on Mars, what life was like on earth, et cetera. And she gave, she gave lots of examples of very beginner level learners doing this task, intermediate level learners, and also quite advanced level learners doing the task. And she was able to show that in fact, the same task could be done in different ways by these different learners. And I think this is possible with a particular type of task, uh, an open task. An open task is a task where um, uh, there's no really fixed single outcome to the task, but there are many possible outcomes to the task. So for example, the beginner level learners in her study tended to talk about very simple topics, whereas the more advanced learners tended to talk about more advanced topics, et cetera. So the outcome was not fixed. There was no specification about which particular topics they would choose to talk about while they were doing the task. There are these various other ways that teachers can use in a mixed ability class, right? Uh, and I don't think I'll go through these. Um, you, you, you have a chance to, uh, to, to read them, okay? Um, I think the final point is work a quick word because it deals with the notion of task repetition. And there's been a lot of research that's looked at task repetition and has found that it is advantageous. And if you remember uh, Natsuko Shintani's study, she used the same task nine times with these six-year-old children. And you might say, well, didn't they get bored? Didn't they, they lose motivation by repeating the task so much? And the answer is, surprisingly, they didn't. It's because they couldn't really do it initially, and then gradually they got better and better at doing it. And also what happened in each actual repetition of the task was not exactly the same as what happened before. Because when you're doing a task and repeating a task, you're not repeating exactly how you did it before. Inevitably, the actual process of doing the task changes in some ways. So task repetition is, I think, uh, uh, a very uh, important thing to do, particularly with less proficient students. Okay. And I'm freezing again. Oops, what's happened here? Where am I? Okay. I've gone back. How do I do task-based teaching with a large class? Okay. Uh, this is particularly important for people in countries like China and Korea because very often teachers um, have quite large classes. Um, the schools that I have visited in Shanghai, for example, very often there can be as many as 40 children in a, in a class, et cetera. 
And so this issue about, you know, how do you do task-based teaching with a large class uh, arises. Um, I, I would point out that teaching a large class is a problem in any kind of teaching, not just in task-based language teaching, but even a more traditional type teaching. And here are some suggestions. Um, one is to conduct tasks in lockstep with the whole class. Um, in other words, uh, the teacher does a task with the whole class. And it's possible to do this even with a very large class. Even with a task like spot the difference, for example, the teacher can have one of the pictures and all the students would have the other pictures. And then the teacher can say, OK, you have to now find out what are the differences between your picture and my picture. And this can be done with the whole class. It doesn't have to be done in pair work, in group work. And the other suggestion I make is that I think it's a good idea um, it, with large classes to make use of what I call closed tasks as opposed to open tasks. The Martian task I mentioned a moment ago is an open task, but the spot the difference task where there are just five differences is a closed task. Now, why is this a good idea with large classes? Because the teacher wants to know whether these students have been successful in achieving the task outcome. And with an open task, there's no way that they can really know whether the students have been successful in achieving the open outcome. But in a closed task, find five differences in the pictures, the teacher can, at the, after the task is over, say, who can tell me who's got the five differences, right? And while they're doing the task, the teacher could even ask them to write down what the five differences are. And then at the end could ask who got all five, who got four, who got three, et cetera. And the other thing I would suggest with large classes is pairs rather than small groups are often a lot easier to organize as well. Are there any task-based course books that I can use. Um, I must admit, I'm not entirely up to date with what publishes, uh, what EFL textbooks or ESL textbooks are currently being produced. But my guess is that by and large, most of the textbooks that are coming out today are still not really truly task-based. Uh, they are, they, they are more task supported. That is to say, for each unit, there will be specific language that is to be taught and practiced. And then there's some kind of task like activity where they can practice using the language um, in, in uh, real operating conditions, communicatively, et cetera. Um, so I think that there is a sort of limitation on uh, what is available. And what this, I think you can actually find lots of tasks online. Uh, I've mentioned the um, website of Jane Willis, and you can look that up. And she's got lots of examples of tasks. And also um, the International Association of Task Based Language Teaching has a task bank. In fact, two task banks, and you can enter those task banks and you can find tasks to do. So it may be that um, we're still lacking truly task-based courses in the main, but there, there, are, there are plenty of tasks available for teachers to actually use. Uh, I would also make one other point, and that is that even if they are really wedded to a course book and do not have much freedom that they're supposed to work through that course book uh, over a semester, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to teach everything that's in that book. And what they could do is extract the tasks from it and then devise their own task-based lessons based on the tasks. So they could remove the kind of 
direct presentation language stuff. They could remove the, the practice exercises and just focus instead on the tasks and design their own task-based lessons. So there are possibilities there, but it, it is a problem. What do I do if my students resist doing tasks? Teacher, I don't want to do this task. Uh, what am I supposed to learn? Uh, you're not teaching me. You're not telling me what I'm supposed to learn, etc. And th this is particularly true of students who are very used to traditional language teaching and also very true of students who have to do an examination that they know prizes accuracy, the, the accurate use of language, including perhaps tests of grammar. Uh, we do know that even though you haven't been taught grammar, you can learn it, and therefore you could try to get students to recognize that you don't need to teach them grammar in order to learn it. Um, and I think also um, we need to recognize that task-based language teaching is motivating. Uh, this is particularly true in specific purpose courses based on real world tasks, because they will be able to see a connection between the tasks they're doing in the classroom and the real world tasks they have to do outside. So, I mean, my main response to this is to recognize that it is a problem and to really rely on trying to make the task-based language teaching as motivating as possible by doing tasks that are directly related to the needs of students or alternatively tasks on topics that are interesting to them. The Martian task, for example, it was very clear that the students were very motivated to actually have a go at doing that task. Okay. I'm trying to move the thing so that I can see my question. I can't even see my question because the stuff is in the way. Okay. How can I do task-based teaching if I have to follow a structural syllabus and prepare students for a traditional test, right? Uh, I think that this is uh, a major problem. Um, and I, I'm not naive. If um, the teacher has to prepare students for a traditional test and the traditional test involves uh, grammar questions, then there's no way that um, I can tell teachers that you shouldn't actually do some direct teaching of grammar. I think we have to recognize that they can do some direct teaching of grammar, even though I do know that a good task-based language course will equip them to do a grammar test. But even so, I don't think you'll convince teachers I don't think you'll convince students, et cetera. Um, so what do I suggest here? I, what I suggest is that um, there are two ways in which you can deal with the issue. One way is um, by using tasks in the classroom, in your classroom teaching, but prepare workshops that allow learners to do more formal work with grammar. And then maybe spending a little bit of time at the beginning of a lesson to go over a workshop, a worksheet, et cetera. And even if they feel that they need to adhere to traditional language teaching most of the time, my second suggestion is maybe set aside um, 15 minutes to do a task in each lesson. In other words, don't feel that you have to do traditional language teaching all the time, even if you think that you must use most of the time for it, still find some time to do task-based language teaching. And I'm frozen again. This is most frustrating. Um, I, I'm going to conclude with... Um, where I am in terms of what I'm recommending about task-based language teaching. 
I am sort of aware of all these problems that I've been talking about. Um, and I'm also aware of the fact that even in a very successful task-based language course, we can still have students who continue to have uh, residual problems with grammar structures. And so what I am currently trying to argue is for a curriculum that involves a modular approach. And this is really my idea of um, what a modular course would look like. So you can see that you've got beginner level at the bottom, advanced level at the top, and then uh, along the horizontal side, you've got the amount of time that is devoted to task-based language teaching and what I've called the structured component, okay? Uh, that is the more traditional language teaching. So I'm really suggesting now that perhaps we need uh, a, a course that accepts that there will need to be some traditional language teaching. But I've argued that what we need to do first of all is to promote communicative competence, communicative ability. And to do that, we really need a task-based approach. So that dominates in the early stages. And then as learners advance, then I think there may be an opportunity uh, to uh, do some direct teaching to help them deal with particular kinds of grammatical and linguistic problems that are not being solved through the task-based component. Uh, and that is basically this slide simply repeats what I have just said, et cetera. Um, I'm going to promote a book. Uh, this is not my very last book, um, but it is a book which does really reflect a lot of my work on task-based language teaching, Reflections on Task-Based Language Teaching, published by Multilingual Matters. And um, thank you for listening. And you can see that I put it in Indonesian because I once gave this talk to a group of Indonesian teachers. But thank you for listening. And there we are. I've got through my talk a little longer. I spoke a little longer than I intended. I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to see if I can open up the chat room now and see what we've got. Thank you so much, Dr. Ellis. Um, I can see that there are a lot of there are a lot of questions as you presented, but then you addressed a lot of them. You kind of was, saw some of the skepticism and the questions. Um, do you see any questions you want to address or would you like me to read them to you? Uh, it's easier if I read them, then I okay. can think about it. Okay. But at the this... moment we've got, I'm, I'm just going through. Mm -hmm. Everyone, please feel free to uh, type more questions in the chat. We'll keep Dr. Ellis with us uh, for maybe a little bit more. Could we also introduce a question via voice? You can try if I can hear it clearly. Thank you very much for this presentation, Dr. Ellis. This is Khalid Ibrahim, one of uh, Len's former colleagues at uh, Anaheim University. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, the word salamat in Arabic means uh, like peace, uh, wishing peace also. Uh, my question okay. is, uh, would you suggest introducing a model of a task performance uh, before asking the learners to do to perform the task or after they perform it? Um, sometimes. Uh, I think it is useful to let the students see uh, a model of the task being performed, uh, maybe by two students that you have given some sort of training and opportunity to practice doing it so that they can see what it looked like. But I just see it as one strategy. I probably wouldn't use it with, with very low level students, beginners. Um, I would be more keen on using input-based tasks with the teacher working with the whole class, but with intermediate and more advanced students, particularly intermediate, I think sometimes look at getting them to see a model uh, would work, yeah. Okay, that was one question. 
I did see a question which I thought was very interesting, which is someone said, where is the input? Mm -hmm. <laughs> where is the input? Um, well, think about Shintani's work, right? As I said, she had these input-based tasks with very simple, she was giving directions about what animals they had to take to the zoo, right? She also had another task about um, uh, shopping in a grocery store as well, which also involved little cards, right? So where's the input in that task? Well, the input comes from the teacher. The teacher is giving the instructions. They hear the instructions. There's the input. I think when whoever asked that question, where's the input, probably was using the word input in a different way from what I would use it. Um, you know, we second language acquisition researchers use input to refer to the language that learners are exposed to. That's input, the language that they're exposed to. And I think that teachers probably think that the word input means what is the specific teaching instructional input that I am giving them, etc. In other words, referring to the direct teaching of some specific feature. And the answer is that the only time that there can be direct teaching in task-based language teaching is really in the post-task stage. And only, only if uh, you have seen that students have a problem with that particular uh, linguistic point. Okay. I'm just flicking through the questions. Good to see that someone has a lot of spot the differences task, right? Uh, remember one point that I made that these tasks can be designed in a focused way or an unfocused way. Yeah, that's Focus, me. You, that's me. My app has maybe about 100 spot the differences tasks, uh, either interactively or just with the app. So. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't oh, get what you were saying. Yeah. So that's me. That's me. I shared that my well, app has like well, about 100 spot, of, uh, spot, spot, the, spot difference. the difference tasks are usually done in pairs, mm -hmm. but they don't have to be. You know, one of the points I made in my talk is that the teacher can do it with the whole class. Teacher has one picture, class has the other, and they can do it. And one very, very good way of doing spot the difference is, in fact, for the teacher to do it with the whole class first, and then maybe put them into pairs and let them have a go at doing it in pairs, et cetera. Um, you know, particularly with information gap tasks, there's a tendency for teachers to think that information gap tasks like spot the difference have to be done in pairs or small groups, et cetera. But it's not the case. You know, all tasks can be done in lockstep with the whole class or they can be done in pairs, or they can be done in small groups. Or you can do a task in lockstep first with the class and let them then have a go at doing the task or a very similar task in pairs, et cetera. There's the question, where's the language input then? Well, I told you, there is no um, grammatical input in the sense of a predetermined uh, information about a grammatical structure that they are supposed to learn, because that's not the purpose of task-based language teaching. Purpose of task-based language teaching is to create contexts for natural, incidental language learning, holistic, natural learning. Uh, another question right after that is, how do you do assessment? How do you do assessment? Well. I would need another talk. I do have a talk <laughs> where I, I do talk about task-based assessment. Um, I mean, basically, ideally, the way you do assessment in task-based language teaching is through task-based assessment. You use tasks. And of course, if you're using closed tasks, then it is possible to assess the actual outcome. Um, you take, for example, uh, the spot the difference, if there's five differences, you can give one mark for 
each difference that they manage to actually um, um, find as a result of doing the task with you, the teacher, right? So closed tasks, uh, particularly if the, the tester or the teacher is doing the task with the students, usually there is a specific outcome and you can evaluate to what extent individual students have achieved that outcome, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so ideally, um, task-based language teaching requires task-based assessment. But as I pointed out, uh, that's not the reality in many teaching situations where there's still more traditional types of assessment, multiple choice, grammar tests, et cetera. And that's one reason why I have argued for a modular approach. It's an acknowledgement that uh, teachers have to prepare students of these kinds of tasks. And therefore, perhaps rather than relying exclusively on task-based language teaching, they should be prepared to mix sometimes do task-based language teaching, sometimes do more traditional language teaching. Okay. And there's the assessment question. Yeah, I agree. I think one reason for such resistance stems from not training teachers. I very much agree. Um, Task-based language teaching is so different from what probably most teachers have experienced when they were learning English themselves or learning a foreign language themselves, that to just say, go into the classroom and do it is not gonna work. And so it needs to be introduced into teacher education. And there is some work uh, on that. You know, What do we need to do in a teacher education program to help teachers be able to successfully innovate with task-based language teaching. Um, very important. That would be another talk. Uh, I do have a PowerPoint on that, but not today. I, I like the next question. Thanks for mentioning about the beginner learners. They are not a blank state, slate. They have linguistic background. Yes, they have. You know, I mean, <laughs> one of the things I make about all learners is because they are human beings, they have what I call pragmatic ability. And by pragmatic ability, I mean an ability to try and make sense of whatever they are exposed to in relation to the context that they find themselves. That's what I mean by pragmatic ability. That's how the children learned in Shintani's study. They learn pragmatically by guessing and then eventually working out what was the correct animal to take to the zoo, et cetera. Um, we all have that pragmatic ability. And it's that pragmatic ability that allows us to learn incidentally. There's an interesting question about vocabulary. Keywords, I think, uh, should we pre-teach them? You know, I, I try not to be too prescriptive. Mm -hmm. I try to adhere to the fundamental principles of task-based language teaching, which is that um, the aim it must be to facilitate incidental language learning, holistic incidental language learning. But equally, uh, I think that there can be a case sometimes for pre-teaching some vocabulary. I'm definitely not keen on pre-teaching grammar because mm -hmm. I think it turns it into PPP. But I think that you can perhaps teach vocabulary. But if you remember, I did make the suggestion that we could have a pre-task planning stage where students are given the task and asked to prepare what they are going to write or say or listen to, et cetera. And they can use their mobiles to look up any individual language. So, you know, rather than relying on the teacher to provide them with the keywords, why do we not sort of put the burden on the student to try and um, identify what vocabulary might help them to do the task, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't think that that is an either or, I think that sometimes there is a case of teachers doing it, but I also think there is a case also 
for more self, a more self-directed approach, uh, letting the learners uh, look up the vocabulary for themselves. Okay, that is the key words one. Yeah. How do we develop a curriculum like that? What is the like that? Task-based, I guess, a task-based curriculum. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, again, that would be another talk. <laughs> um, it's to do how do we design a whole task-based course, mm -hmm. right? And um, I think that by and large, uh, one needs to follow the principle that you start with fairly easy, simple tasks, and then you move on to tasks that are more difficult. And there has been research that's investigated that and looked at task complexity in order to try to provide a principled way for sequencing tasks. But equally, you remember what I said about the Martian task. You can have some tasks that can actually be done in very simple, easy ways, and other tasks that um, can involve much more complex language, et cetera. So it's not necessarily the task itself that determines uh, whether the task can, can be done simply or whether it can be done in a more complex way. Um, obviously, if you're starting off with task-based language teaching, I would strongly recommend that you start with teacher-fronted tasks and mainly listening tasks. Getting students used to the idea that they are not going to be taught bits and pieces of language as a basis for each lesson, but are going to be engaged in trying to understand and use language themselves. So I, I would start with um, I would start with predominantly input-based tasks, and then gradually introduce um, uh, output-based tasks, speaking tasks, writing tasks, etc. I would tend to move from uh, using predominantly closed tasks, clo tasks that have a definite fixed outcome, um, and then introduce open tasks at a somewhat more later date, etc. So I think there are, there are general ideas, there are general principles that we can use in order to try to work out what tasks we use. But by and large, I think that it would have to be up to the teacher to decide what sorts of tasks they thought one would be motivating for their students. And secondly, was, was within their ability to be able to do, et cetera. So that a, a lot rests on the teacher and the teacher's knowledge of his own students, et cetera. <laughs> I think I, I need to finish, if you don't mind, I'm yes. beginning to get a little hoarse. Um, <laughs> There are lots of interesting questions. I don't know if you want my PowerPoint. I haven't sent it yes. yet to you, yes. Lynn, yes. but if I you... will send it once I finish off and say bye-bye to everybody yes. here. Well, thank you so much for your presentation and spending more time with us answering those questions. I see that there are more questions there, but I hope that you uh, will have opportunities to listen to Dr. Ellis again in many different other contexts. And uh, I myself will be presenting on tasks um, in February hosted by the Department of State in the US here. I will share with you more information. My colleague here, Huang Nguyen, and I have been presenting about tasks as well. So we are happy to share more. And uh, please allow me to just quickly share my screen here because uh, I would like to invite you. I hope that I'm sharing the right screen. So I would like you to, um, to invite you to try my app. Am I sharing my screen um, here? You should go okay. back to the previous slide. Okay, previous slide. Oh, uh, you just skipped it. Okay. Go back. Uh, go, go back. One more slide. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. So I took some screenshot. I'm happy to share as well. So um, I just want to share with you that I uh, I developed an app that is task based to connect learners to talk in pairs based on communicative tasks. 
And I also have input-based tests as well. Learners don't need to find someone else to talk with, but my main goal is to help them to develop uh, communicative competence through tests. So uh, you can download it with the QR code here, or you can just go to my website at juling.org. Uh, I share a lot on social media these days. So please, uh, you're welcome to follow me or uh, connect me with me on LinkedIn. But I think I have to finish here. And uh, thank you, Dr. Alice, very much okay. again for- Thank you everybody for listening. I hope you found it useful, helpful. Thank okay. you. I hope you have a relaxing weekend after this. I, I am. I'm going to have a little bit of lunch now and maybe a little siesta. And then I have another Zoom talk to do. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Um, if you, I will send the recording as well uh, through an email, and this will be available on Facebook as well. Thank you so much, everyone. See you next time. <laughs>